Greetings environmentalists for lecture 16. Four more to go in this semester. This is one of the favorites of folks and it's endangered species. As a matter of fact, the remaining lectures are pretty darn dynamite. So I think you're going to be looking forward to a really great lineup. As we talk about endangered species, I'd like to start off our conversation by saying I want you to think about it, what you think is an endangered species. If you don't mind, would you humor me and just get out a piece of paper and jot down like five different animals or plants that you think could be endangered? And just take a second to do that. So I'm going to give you a moment while you're doing that and then think on it because this is an important step for being able to recognize what an endangered species is. Now that you've gotten your list made, I bet you there's some big animals on there like tigers and elephants and rhinoceroses and maybe bald eagles and gray wolves and things of that nature. Well, interestingly enough, endangered species, for everyone that's listed, the six out of 10 are plants, not animals. We'll primarily focus on mammals and a few other things during our course of action in this lecture. But so much of endangered species is not about the animals themselves, it's about the legislation that has been developed in order to protect our animals and plants. So what are you going to get for learning objectives by this lecture series? We're going to look at some historical regulations that provided stepping stones to help us get where we are today for the Endangered Species Act. It didn't just happen overnight. It took over a century to make this a reality. We're going to talk about the CITES Convention, what that is, how it works, and the purpose of the red list. We're going to identify the two United States regulatory agencies that have regulatory jurisdiction over the Endangered Species Act. ESA does refer to Endangered Species Act. We're going to describe the process by which a species is listed and protected by the uh, Endangered Species Act. And then we'll look at some species towards the end. So the historically important legislation can't be understated as, a, as an absolute necessary foundation for understanding how the Endangered Species Act came to play. The American bison case study kind of starts this whole process into motion. Bison were hunted almost to the brink of extinction in the late 19th century by market hunters. This proved to be a really big problem because we had millions of herds of bison and reduced them to just a few several thousand by the turn of the century. This uh, was a really noteworthy profession to be in for making money because a good hide sold for three bucks at that time. Excellent hide sold for about 50. Hunters and trappers would be considered highly compensated if they made a dollar a day. So think about that if you could wipe out maybe 50 of these things at once in one herd, you had yourself a rich living. So this was part of the American culture back in the frontier days. After 1873, commercial hunting of the American bison reached a record all, all high, and 100,000 animals were slaughtered each day. So this was a devastating uh, issue, not just for the environment and for the bison, but also for Native Americans, which we'll get to shortly. The construction of the transcontinental railroads through Colorado and Kansas literally split the nation's herds into two halves, and this played an important role on how the outcome of the bison would uh, endure the test of time. As the herds continued to die off, President Ulysses S. Grant submitted a pocket bill to try to protect the herds in 1874. Well, in 1875, General Philip Sheraton pleaded with the U.S. Congress to slaughter the remaining herds of bison, mainly to deprive the Native Americans of their natural food resource. So these are skulls of bison right here, and this is a famous guy. I mean, it's, he's not in history books as the friendliest guy on the block, right? So this was an important step because if we could eradicate the food resources of the American Native Americans, 
if we could eradicate the food resources of the Native Americans, we could end up kind of quitting that battle that we had and continuing to frontier west. By 1884, the American bison was on the brink of extinction, and this was definitely a correlation to human influence. So our first law comes into place that really takes a hold on the American people's what I'd call freedoms, and this is called the Lacey Act of 1900. You need to recognize it for what it did and how it started the government getting into private business and then recognizing how it also protected the environment. It has two parts to it. Congressman John Lacey introduced the act in 1900, and he's uh, the name, of course, is where it came from, the Lacey Act, John Lacey. The act protects plants and wildlife by creating penalties for those who violate the regulations. So what did the regulations say? It prohibits the trade in fish, wildlife, and plants that have been illegally taken, possessed, transported, or sold. So that key word of illegally possessed, transported, or sold now means the government has put some stipulations on what is allowable for hunting. This did not go over very well, as you can imagine, with that's how people relied on getting their food, was they went out and hunted, they planted their crops, and so this was the first major step in that process of regulating hunting. The Migratory Bird Conservation Act of 1929 was the next major set of legislation that came to be, and this was actually to protect the whooping crane, which is what you see in the picture. This first federal law that allowed the government to claim land, important thing, to be able to claim land and utilize federal funds to create suitable areas of land, water, or both for use as migratory bird reservations. In other words, the government can take the land for public use. The act was passed in response to the near extinction of the whooping crane. Interestingly enough, we were followed by legislation in 1940 with the Bald Eagle Protection Act. This act was necessary because between 1917 and 1952, Alaskan bounty hunters killed more than 100,000 bald eagles to discourage perching sites. This act made it illegal to kill bald eagles except in Alaska, but the numbers of birds continued to decline. Why was this? Was there still poaching going on? Certainly, but the real cause came from contamination of a pesticide known as DDT, and this was thought to be the reason of the eagle population decline. So it's not like the farmers set out to kill the eagles with DDT. They were trying to manage pesticides or pests by using this pesticide. And what happened was it got into our water supplies where the fish were and into rodents and so forth. And that's what the eagles fed on. Contamination at the bald eagles food supplies was definitely impacted by DDT. DDT actually thinned the shells of bald eagle uh, eggs and adults were not necessarily lethally dosed by consuming DDT. However, it impacted their ability to uh, be fertile and to pervert, uh, produce viable eggs. In other words, they didn't produce enough metabolism to have enough calcium to build strong enough eggs to last the duration of the birthing cycle. So DDT became banned in the 70s, and it's attached forever in relationship to the American bald eagle. Continuing on with the bald eagle, it remained protected until July 12th of 1995 when it was actually reduced in its listing status to threatened. Ultimately in 2005 the bald eagle was delisted completely from the Endangered Species Act, which is a rather cumbersome and long-term process to achieve. The reason it could be was demonstration was made uh, by, text, or by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that clearly showed that the bald eagle had recovered from the brink of extinction. It's still protected by the Bald Eagle Protection Act of 1940 today, and penalties for violating this act can result in a fine of up to $100,000 and or imprisonment for one year. And that's per violation. So always think about these violations as not just one 
uh, holistic thing, but it's by individual case. In other words, do it more than once, get caught more than once, it's per instance. The next important act that was passed was the Water and Land Conservation Fund Act of 1965. This provided the money for acquisition of land waters for the preservation of species of fish and other miscellaneous wildlife that are threatened with extinction. The main emphasis of the act focused on recreation and protection of national treasures in the forms of parks and protected forests slash wildlife and wildlife areas. So this was another step in that direction of where they, the government could acquire some land. If you're seeing a trend here, this is starting to get into private business, isn't it? And so some people weren't too happy about this, but it became necessary as a population began to grow. The Endangered Species Preservation Act of 1966 would come into play, and this authorized the Secretary of the Interior to list endangered, quote-unquote, domestic, meaning to the United States, fish and wildlife. It also gave authorization for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to spend up to $15 million a year to acquire land, in other words, to purchase it, to find suitable habitat for listed species. Another instance of using government uh, entity and rules and power in order to help the animals with their habitat. This did not regulate the commerce of endangered species or listed species. That would come in later. So understand that the Preservation Act, the Endangered Species Preservation Act, is all about domestic species. That brings us to the Endangered Species Conservation Act of 1969. You're like, really? We're still not even to the Endangered Species Act. There's a lot of laws that built us to where we got to the Endangered Species Act. This amended the original law to provide additional protection up to species by uh, in putting a worldwide danger aspect to it. So instead of it being domestic, if it was in danger of worldwide extinction, uh, we would not allow it to be imported or sold in the United States. So that was a big deal. An example could be uh, ivory from elephants as an example. This expanded the Lacey's Act ban on commerce to include mammals, reptiles, amphibians, mollusks, and even crustaceans. So it was a fairly large expansion to the law. Well, this brings us into what CITES is. CITES stands for an acronym, that is, for Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. So fauna standing for organisms, flora for plants. This is amendment of the first Endangered Species Act led to the first international meeting of interested countries to adopt a convention or treaty to conserve endangered species. The first meeting was held in Washington, D.C. in February of 1973 and produced the treaty known as CITES. So let me explain a little bit about that treaty. For a government to ratify and be a voting member of CITES, they had to actually ratify the law. In other words, they had to adopt the law in their own culture of whatever uh, governmental entity they, uh, infrastructure they had that supported the mission statement of CITES, which was to, which we'll learn about in just a minute, was to prevent the illicit sale of and trade of animals at risk of extinction. And same thing for plants. So if you didn't actually make laws you weren't a ratifying member. So that's kind of how we came to be with the Endangered Species Act. CITES manages the International Union for Conservation of Nature known as the IUCN. And the IUCN is responsible for maintaining and updating with good scientific data something called the RED list, guaranteed test question. And this is red list is a threatened and endangered species across the globe, and it looks at its taxonomic conservation status, distribution information of species that have been globally evaluated. So we are going to have a list for the United States for the Endangered Species Act, but there's also an international list. Understand that they may not agree always, and that sometimes confuses the public as to why can't the ESA be the same as the red list. Well, you're looking at a holistic global view instead of just the United States. 
Well, that brings us to the Endangered Species Act of 1973. This is going to be a surprise. President Richard Nixon, not known for some of his great works in the environment, otherwise known for some of the more scandalous issues that he might have faced in you know the rest of the story on that if you take in your history classes. But nevertheless, we have a lot to thank to, for President Nixon's work in the environment. He did, felt like our protection of threatened and endangered species was inadequate. He wanted us to ratify and become the primary example for the world on what can be done to protect threatened and endangered species. So Congress responded with a newly written law, which was signed on December 18th, 1973. So think about when sites first met in February. And then in December, we had less than one year and we had this law in place. That's pretty incredible. So the process of the law and the purpose of the law was to protect species and the ecosystems on which they depend. How that would work would be a complete another story. So let's get to business and tell you how it works. The wildlife management system is an infrastructure that was made many, many years ago, and the Endangered Species Act is administered underneath the wildlife management system by two federal uh, entitled agencies. And what I mean by entitled, they have regulatory jurisdiction, meaning they can enforce, pass laws, and so forth for the Endangered Species Act. The first one is the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, and they handle all the freshwater fit and fish and forest and all terrestrial species. Terrestrial meaning land-bearing species. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA Fisheries, handles marine fisheries and mammals. So we learned about these two agencies back uh, earlier in the semester, and uh, you learned how they both fit into the Endangered Species Act back then. Now you're going to see how it actually works in getting a species listed. So we're going to divide the Endangered Species Act into sections. I didn't divide them into sections. The lawmakers did. So there's more than the sections that we're showing here, but these are some of the key sections that I think that you should be made aware of. So we're going to start with Section 4, which is by far the most extensive and work our way into section 5, 9, 10, and 11. And I'll give you a way to help remember how these operate and how they work. For section 4, this is listing and critical habitat designation. The ESA requires that listing determinations be made on the best scientific and commercial information available. There was a scandal, oh, almost a decade or more ago where a senator put a bill together in good faith that was actually done to try to help promote uh, people uh, in the rural environments to voluntarily seek best management practices to help protect endangered species. But nevertheless, it didn't quite go as planned, and it made the scientific community really mad. So they were going to put the decision-making of putting animals and plants on the endangered species or getting them off the endangered species list in the hands of politicians. So you could imagine how that went over. Not so good, right? So Section 4 prohibits the consideration of an economic impact when deciding the merit of a species listing. And Section 4 contains three parts. The listing procedures, fairly extensive. You're fixing to learn it recovery plan development, and critical habitat determinations. So let's talk about listing and critical habitat first. Section 4 of the Endangered Species Act establishes a link between habitat protection and recovery goals requiring the identification and protection of all lands, all water, and air necessary for species recovery. You need to really think about that's comprehensive, right? So since habitat loss is the primary threat for most listed species, Congress amended the Endangered Species Act in 1978 and again in 1982 to include critical habitat designation, very important term, critical habitat designation as a mandatory, not optional, mandatory requirement for any listed species. So what is a critical habitat? All federal agencies are prohibited from authorizing, funding, or carrying out actions that would quote-unquote destroy or adversely modify a critical habitat. 
So a critical habitat could be like this area right here in the desert that's needed for some kind of cactus to grow. If you have disturbance to that, let's say you're building a highway or you're expanding a residential area, you can't do that. You, if, even if it's the state or the federal government, they just can't do that. They have to prove that they're not. So the Endangered Species Act requires that critical habitat be designated at the time the rule is published or within one year of the species listing date. So you can't just decide to put a species on there and go, oh, by the way, in two or three years, just because it looks like you need to, oh, critical habitat time, we, we're going to take your property from you, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't work that way there has to be shown that critical habitat really exists. So what's a recovery plan? All listed and endangered and threatened species will have recovery plans developed and implemented that identify three specific components. Number one, they're going to identify a site-specific management action needed for a species recovery. What does that really mean? Is there something at a site, a location, for example, over here it shows wolf recovery area. Is the site have something unique about it that needs to be protected in order for the species to recover? Is it a certain amount of acreage of land? Is it trees? Is it grass? Is it some kind of protected water body? Number two, does it have a measurable criteria to indicate when a specific species is a candidate for removal from the Endangered Species Act? Because one of the complaints that Congress has is that it takes a long time, sometimes forever, it seems like, to get a species off the list. We put them on, never get them off, and we're constantly investing money in that process. So we do want a mechanism to improve a species' health so they can come off the list. And the third required element of a recovery plan is a very important one. What's the cost estimate for implementing these goals? Even though it said they weren't going to look at economic factors, they have to look at what's realistic in order to make this determination. So when we look at the listing criteria, the Federal Register is how listings are made. And I realize that the Federal Register is probably not sitting on your nightstand right now as your nighttime reading, although it would be really good to cure your insomnia should you have some. So the Federal Register is updated. It's actually a book, but it's done online. So the most current stuff is online. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA Fisheries put their proposal notices and decisions concerning any proposed species in this document. So if you have a vital interest in one of these, you better be reading the Federal Register on a regular basis. So who can actually put on the radar screen of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or NOAA that they think something should be uh, proposed for listing, let's say, a threatened, endangered, something along those lines. First of all, organizations, and I can think of something like the Sierra Club or Audubon Society, or you can think about maybe it's an organization like a major oil and gas company. So organizations can have data that shows they want to put an animal on or they are against it. Uh, same thing with a plant. An individual, let's say that an individual scientist or whoever has data that they've been collecting and they feel that this, uh, this needs to be looked at for listing, they can submit that. And then, of course, the two agencies themselves can submit their data and make a proposal. Once this process goes through its full-time process, then it must for public notice. All of this information that people submit during public comment period are taken in and evaluated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or NOAA Fisheries. So let's look at what that time frame would be. So these two agencies, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA Fisheries, determines if the petition, whether it's from an individual, an organization, or from themselves, is merited via one of two ways. A status review, and that occurs at the, uh, of the petition, and it's initiated based on a set of criteria for each specific listing category. For example, endangered has its own listing category, so does threatened. Once the status review is complete, a proposed rule is published in the Federal Register and allows for a 60-day public comment period. 60 days is guaranteed test question. 
And I use my sister as an example here because she's an oil and gas attorney for a major recognizable oil company. So she does all the domestic uh, contracts for oil and gas for this very giant corporation. So she has lobbyists working for her, or she also has other attorneys and other people that are paid dearly by the company to be watching the Federal Register. So if my sister goes on vacation, they're not going to miss some important animal or plant that's been proposed for listing while she's on her honeymoon or on a two-week vacation or a month vacation, and she misses the 60-day window. Because if she misses the comment period for this corporation, I guarantee you she's not going to have a job when she gets back. So it's important to always be on the lookout regardless of which side that you could be. And I'm not saying the oil and gas people are wrong by any means. They Most of them have excellent data that shows organisms may or may not need to be listed at all. So the listing criteria it gets a bit tricky here. In order to qualify as merited to be listed, it only has to meet the organism one of these five. It can certainly meet more. It has a minimum requirement of meeting one. So the first one's the most common, present or threatened destruction or modifications of a species habitat or range. In other words, where they live, the area that they live, not working out so well for them. Number two, overutilization for species for commercial scientific recreation or educational purposes. So commercial is no-brainer. Educational purposes, that would be recreation, such as those two things go hand-in-hand, hand, hunting and outdoor use. Scientific, believe it or not, can overutilize certain animals. And so those things I buy off on. Not as common as number one, though. Number three, disease or predation of a species is eminent. And predation is not by humans. It's by usually another animal. I can think of a disease where we have an Ebola strain that's impacting a group of gorillas and those gorillas are on the brink of extinction. So that would be an example of how they could be put on the endangered species list. Number four I'm going to come back to in just a minute. Number five, other natural or man-made factors affecting the survivals uh, of the species. So that's very rarely used because there's like multi-pages long of requirements that you have to meet to number five. But number four humors me. Having worked for a regulatory agency, I find this a bit funny. Inadequacy of regulatory mechanisms to protect the species. So what does that really mean? Boils down to this. The rules don't work or there are no rules. So that is not a very commonly used one, but it's out there. My point is whether you're looking at criteria one, criteria two, three, four, or five, there's specific items for each listing status that is for number one for endangered. So endangered would have a set of criteria for number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Threatened has the same thing. It has a whole set of criteria for number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. So you're getting my gist that there's a lot of red tape that goes on with this process. Now, once we get a listing criteria where it's actually gone for public notice, and remember public notice was 60 days, right? That information comes back to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and also to the NOAA Marine Fisheries, and they have three options. Option number one, which is usually the most utilized of the three, is they publish a final rule in the Federal Register based solely on biological criteria, going back to that prior set of five list, right, that approves or revises the proposed rule. Number two, they just up and flat out withdraw the proposed rule. This has happened where a lobbying agency, uh, and I can think of one for the National Rifle Association, stepped in and provi provided really good data on a prairie bird that prevented it from being listed. And uh, so that it matters who all is in that vested interest at the public comment period. But if you're not get if you don't get your comments in during that 60 days, too bad because you're not an, an invested party or an interested party. So the third one is to extend the proposed rule for up to six months for additional research because they just didn't have enough information to make a decision on. They can't use number three indefinitely. So it, number one is usually the primary route that we had when we're making a rule. So let's get into the listing categories for a little bit, and it's overwhelming, and you may wonder, why do you need to know the letters? Here's why. 
When you get into the rule for the Endangered Species Act where all the animals and plants are listed, it has letters that are out to their scientific name. First of all, you got to know their scientific name. If you don't know the letters, you can't interpret how they're listed. So it can be very confusing. In other words, the word extinct is not out there or the world word extinct in the wild. So you got to know that EX stands for extinct. So let's go through the listing categories. EX is the abbreviation used for extinct and it occurs when an organism has no possible way to reproduce or continue living as a species. So in other words, they are uh, unable to reproduce. So they're done, they're gone, they're in the past. Woolly mammoths, Columbian mammoths, non-avian dinosaurs, trilobites, those are all extinct, okay? Extinct in the wild is abbreviated with an EW. Now, this occurs when an organism cannot reproduce or continue living as a species except in captivity, like the Micronesian Guam kingfisher over here to the right. So they have to be in captivity in order to have successful breeding. The chances of us rescuing this organism long term and bringing it back to a healthy population is pretty minimal. So small amounts of money to protect these will be put into this category. However, for the next listing category, CR, and it's not CE, it's CR, like Charlie Roger, it's critically endangered. This occurs when an organism is facing an extreme high risk of extinction extinction in the immediate future based on a set of established criteria, criteria one, two, three, four, and five that we saw earlier, right? All right, so imminent threat for the immediate future of extinction. So that's the way that we know something's critically endangered. What makes something just endangered? E-N, not just E. So how is endangered different from critically endangered? Its abbreviation is different, first of all. It's E-N, Echo November. So when you're looking at that, it's not just E, so it's Echo in November, E-N, and it occurs when the organism is not critically endangered but faces a very high risk of extinction in the near future. See how that's different? Still a very high risk of extinction, but not extremely high, and it's in the near future, not the immediate future. So there is a designation difference between the two. Another two categories are threatened. The abbreviation for threatened is T for tango and has a high potential for the risk of becoming endangered, not extinct, but endangered in the near future based on that specific set of criteria, going back to the criteria one, two, three, four, and five we learned about earlier. How is vulnerable and different from threatened? V for Victor, N for November, VN. Vulnerable occurs when an organism is not endangered or threatened, but still faces a high risk of becoming endangered in the wild within the medium term future based on that set of criteria, one, two, three, four, and five. Believe it or not, there's another group called lower risk, LR. So you're getting into the stuff that's harder to define. This occurs when an organism has been evaluated but it does not satisfy the established criteria regarding other categories such as critically endangered, endangered, threatened, or vulnerable. So lower risk fits into an umbrella. So if you could think of, here's lower risk, you've got three tiers coming out from underneath there. The first one is conservation dependence, CD. Charlie Delta. Organisms that require a habitat-specific restoration or conservation program within a five-year window of time. In other words, that five-year window should help turn that thing around, turn their situation around. The second group is near-threatened, NT. These are organisms do that do not qualify for conservation dependent but remain close to qualifying to vulnerable. So let's get to the last one, LC, least concern. And these are organisms that neither qualify for conservation dependent nor near threatened. We're not really concerned about them. They've been evaluated, but they don't qualify for any of the other categories. All right, there's still two more categories. You're like, really? Seriously? There are.
There's something called data deficient, DD. So delta delta occurs when there is inadequate data to make a direct or indirect assessment of an organism's risk of extinction based on its distribution and or population status. When could this happen? Let's say you've got some kind of elusive bighorn sheep out on some Pacific island that nobody gets to, and they're so aloof that if we have a scientist out there, you're probably only going to catch them once in a you know blue moon. And by the way, do you know what a blue moon is? Two full moons in the same month this is what makes a blue moon. So if you had something like that, that would be data deficient. So if we collected the data, they would probably fall into another category, but we just don't have enough data to make that decision yet. Then, of course, there's the not evaluated, NE. So if an organism's not been evaluated against the five criteria for any of the list, it would fall under an NE. So uh, that could be like your pet lab. I mean, they're not going to be evaluated yet. There's no reason to have them there. This is a great place to take a break, and we'll come back and learn more about endangered species after we return. Thanks.